This is part four of our series on the seven sacraments of the church. You know what? I learned something about myself as I was preparing this teaching. Uh, This is a Bible school, seminary level teaching. And so I really had to dive deep into the sacraments to understand what these sacraments are about and, and how to prepare this teaching. And this is what I discovered about myself in preparing the teaching. I have a very sacramental worldview. And I suspect that most of you listening to me do as well. You know, most of us Protestants, we steer away from words like sacrament and sacred because we don't want to sound too much like we're uh, part of the Roman Catholic Church, you know. But sacrament just comes from the word sacred, and that just means holy or of God. And when we say something or someone is sanctified, we mean that they're of God, that they are holy. And so although we may not call something sacred or holy, we believe, especially because of what we see in the Old Testament, that God does indeed make things and people holy sometimes, and that God does holy things on this earth. It's okay to say that God does something sacred or holy. So get your pencil and paper out, and I want you to write down some scriptures. I'm going to give you over a dozen scriptures um, about what is holy. All of these scriptures come from the New Testament. It comes under the New Covenant. This is not part of the Old Covenant, okay? This is part of the Covenant of Grace. The first uh, um, scripture is Matthew 27, 53. Matthew 27, 53. It says people entered Jerusalem. They entered the holy city. So cities can be holy. Mark 6, 20. Mark 6, 20 says that John the Baptist was a holy man. This is in the New Testament. Luke 1, 70. Luke 1, 70 says that the prophets were holy. Luke 9.26, Luke 9.26 says that angels are holy. Well, they're of God. I guess that makes sense, right? Romans 11.16, Romans 11.16 talks about how a piece of dough or a root of a plant can be holy. Well, that's just like the bread and the wine that we share in communion. It can be holy. Romans 12.1. Romans 12, 1, sacrifices are holy because they are dedicated to God. Sacrifice your car, your house to the Lord. It'll become holy. 1 Corinthians 7, 14, 1 Corinthians 7, 14, children can be made holy because of a believing parent. Do you realize that your children are holy to God? You know, if we realize that, maybe we'd treat our children a little bit differently, right? Ephesians 1, 4. Ephesians 1, 4. If you are a believer in Jesus as the Son of God, then you are holy. There are many scriptures that confirm this specific concept about how Christians are holy. Ephesians 1, uh, no, 1 Corinthians 16, 20. 1 Corinthians 16, 20. A kiss can be holy. There were many scriptures that said that. Ephesians 2, 21. Ephesians 2, 21. The church of Jesus on this earth is holy. If you're a Christian, you're not just some person with a religious view of life, okay? You've been made holy before God, and you're part of an organization that is literally God's holy dwelling place here on this earth. The church, it's holy. 1 Timothy 2, 8, our hands are holy. Well, of course they are. (laughs) Jesus lives in and through me, so my hands are now His hands. And of course, that means my hands are holy. But they're holy 24-7. I need to remember that. Hebrews 13-11. Hebrews 13-11. A place can be made holy by God. And also, priests can be made holy by God. 2 Peter 1-18. 2 Peter 1.18 says that a mountain can be made holy. That's where I want to live, the holy mountain. 2 Peter 3 and 11. 2 Peter 3.11. Our conduct, how we act, 
can be holy. Yes, things, people, and places can be holy. They can be sanctified. They can be sacred, even in the New Testament age. We need to get over our aversion to thinking about holy people or holy things, okay? It's just the way God works. And when God touches something on this earth, He makes it holy. Okay, so back to the seven sacraments of the church. I now realize that there are many more sacraments and acts and rites and ceremonies that could be considered sacraments uh, other than just these seven official sacraments of the church. And I also realize that many of the newer denominations, they only call communion and baptism sacraments. But you know what? They still do all the things of a sacrament. They just don't call it that. For example, uh, the Assemblies of God, most Pentecostal churches, they say there are only two sacraments, baptism and communion. But you go into one of their churches and you'll notice that they perform regularly the sacrament of anointing the sick or healing the sick. Uh, What do they do? By definition, they lay hands, they anoint with oil, they pray for the sick, and then they expect God to heal. That's a sacrament. That's the sacrament of healing the sick, right? (laughs) You know, it's the same thing with ordination. They don't call it a sacrament. But what they do has all the hallmarks, all the characteristics of a sacrament. Let's get over uh, our fear of calling things sacraments or holy, okay? Anyhow, what I'm trying to say is as I better understand what a sacrament is and how God works through sacraments, I realize that I have a very sacramental worldview. There are so many areas of my life where I see God doing something holy and miraculous. There are so many areas where I see that I partner with God in a covenantal act of some kind where I do something normal and human, and then I expect God to touch that situation and do something holy and miraculous. And I don't even have to be a Roman Catholic to call these things sacraments, okay? (laughs) Join me today as I share my sacramental worldview on two of the church sacraments, confession, or forgiveness, or reconciliation, or penance, whatever your group calls it. And then the other one is holy matrimony. Okay, sacrament of penance and confession, or reconciliation is what I like to call it, because its ultimate purpose uh, is to restore a person to right relationship with God, or to reconcile them to their loving Heavenly Father. And this is the sacrament in its most basic form. Uh, There's a human part, right? So two humans get together and one confesses to the other that they have sinned. The one doing the confessing repents and says that they want to be forgiven. Okay? The God part of this sacrament is that because of Jesus and what he did on the cross, God forgives their sins and washes away those sins. Okay, that's it. That's the sacrament. And this sacrament comes from James 5, verse 16, and 1 John 1, 8, and 9. Let's go to James 5. James 5, verse 16. The sacrament of healing the sick comes from verses 14 and 15. The sacrament starts <clears throat> comes from verse 16 where James writes, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. We're going to come back to what that means, how you confess and pray for healing in the same um, sacrament. 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9 John writes, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, in this sacrament, in sacramental churches, It usually involves a bishop, a priest, a deacon, uh, somebody in uh, in the clergy, and a penitent. That's what you'd call the one who is doing the confessing, right? 
And in these sacramental churches, one of the most sacred vows that a clergy takes is that they will never reveal to anyone what is said in confession. And that makes confession a safe place for the penitent. Matter of fact, maybe the only safe place for them, right? In sacramental churches, there is a rite, a ceremony, a liturgy, whatever you want to call it for this sacrament. And in its most basic form, the rite usually begins with the penitent saying something like this, Bless me, for I have sinned. And then the priest guides the penitent to confess what's on his heart. God steps into the sacrament at this point and washes away the confessed sins. And at this point, in the ceremony, the priest reassures the penitent that they have been forgiven and that all their sins have been clean, cleansed and washed away. They're now made innocent. And in some traditions, the rite concludes by the priest asking the penitent, this question, or uh, yeah, asking them to do this. They said, uh, go your way free from sin, but also pray for me, a sinner. Now, to me, the beauty of this sacrament is that it gives people an opportunity for a time of inner healing and counseling. Let's go back to James real quick. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. I believe this is talking about inner healing, spiritual healing, deliverance healing. You know, when someone goes for confession, it's because they're troubled by something in their life. Maybe it's a habitual sin, or maybe it's a new temptation that they're struggling with. <clears throat> maybe it's an attitude that they don't like seeing in themselves. Or maybe they're just in emotional pain and they need someone to pray with them. Well, when someone comes to me for confession, I know that the Holy Spirit is going to move. He's going to reveal their heart in this situation. And usually the Lord speaks to them and sets them free from any kind of judgment or condemnation. And so after the penitent tells me what's on their heart, we invite the Holy Spirit into our prayers and we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what's really going on here. And it's amazing some of the things that the Holy Spirit will reveal during this time of confession because it's really becoming a time of inner healing prayer. The Holy Spirit never tells the penitents deep, dark secrets. <laughs> the Holy Spirit just doesn't do that on us. So you don't have to be afraid of that. But he does often help us to understand what's going on. Uh, why do we keep doing this same sin over and over again? Or, or where did this rotten attitude come from? Okay. Now, almost without exception, the Holy Spirit zeroes in on the areas of unforgiveness, bitterness, and anger, and helps the penitent let go of those things and forgive those, so that then in turn, the penitent can be forgiven. It's usually much easier to receive forgiveness after you have forgiven. You know what? I have never done a confession session where the penitent doesn't leave light and free and happier than they arrived. And this always makes me and them feel good about confession. Okay, in this sacrament, the rite of reconciliation or confession... Is that needed every time you sin? Well, you know what? There are some denominations that say yes. Um, I say no. <laughs> this sacrament isn't for every time you sin. Okay. I believe that we all should pray a prayer of forgiveness at least once a day. You know, when I do that, I repent on behalf of me and my family members, our nations, everybody on the prayer line, all that sort of thing. And this is just part of my morning prayers. The sacrament of reconciliation is for when you're struggling with a sin. This is especially true with habitual sins, sins that you just can't seem to overcome. If you're struggling and you're striving, but you're not operating in victory, then you need help. You need to call on the spiritual leaders of yours, those that you can trust, uh, somebody that you know loves you, somebody that hears from the Holy Spirit, make sure that they can hear from the Holy Spirit. 
And, you know, when you're consistently losing the battle with temptation, it's because there's something else that's hindering you. There's a trauma. There's a destructive memory. There's a a foothold of the devil. There's something going on. And you need some help finding that place of healing. That's why, to me, this sacrament is not primarily about confession or forgiveness. It's really about reconciliation, bringing us back to this place where our relationship with Jesus is made right. So don't fight the battle with temptation for weeks or months. Uh, Go now. Find a priest you can trust. Um, Spend some time with them in the Holy Spirit, seeking God, getting answers, getting deliverance, getting set free. Matter of fact, you know, as I, as I say that, I realize there's somebody listening to me. You really need to do this. Uh, you've been struggling and the Lord says, I want to set you free. I want to do some inner healing. Put yourself in a place where you can do that. Submit yourself to this sacrament of confession and reconciliation. Um, So where do we start with uh, the disagreements amongst the church on this sacrament? You know, some of the newer denominations don't see this as a sacrament. Actually, many of the newer denominations don't think we should confess our sins to any other human. There are some that teach that. And they say that confession should be only made to God. But when they say that, They're missing James 5, 16 that says, Confess your sins to one another. I said this before. um, uh, And to me, this sacrament is more about healing and reconciliation than it is about confession of our sins anyway. Now, on the other end of the spectrum from that view are those that are super religious about this sacrament. And they believe that you can only confess your sins to a bishop or a priest. You cannot go to God directly asking for forgiveness. And they teach that only a priest or bishop can actually give you forgiveness. Uh, They might word it as only a priest or a bishop can absolve you of your sins. These are the same folks who teach that only bishops and priests can pray for healing. I think that maybe, you know, they put the traditions of man ahead of the Word of God. They've missed some scriptures. Turn to 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. Let's see what that says. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. There is not another man or dead person in there in that chain of mediation. 1 John 1, 9. We read this earlier. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's no mention in these scriptures of needing to go through somebody else to receive forgiveness. Okay, so now you know about the sacrament of penance, confession, reconciliation. Um, Don't sit around hurting and being defeated, okay? Find a clergy you can confess to. Someone who hears from the Holy Spirit. Someone that can help you get inner healing. Someone that can help get you set free. Someone that can bring you back into right relationship with Jesus. That's what this sacrament is all about. Okay, let's start in on the sacrament of holy matrimony. I confess that I wanted to finish it today, but we're not going to be able to. So we'll start today and finish next time. Notice that I didn't say this sacrament is the sacrament of marriage. Now, technically, if you look up matrimony in the dictionary, it'll say that matrimony is the state of being married. And then you look up married and it says that's being united to, or it says spouses, doesn't specify who or what kind, spouses being united in a consensual contractual relationship. Well, that's the definition you might get out of the dictionary. But I can tell you that's not God's definition of holy matrimony, okay? Marriage is a holy institution established by God. Marriage is not, or at least it's not supposed to be, just two people deciding that they're going to live together for a while. Okay, 
Marriage is a permanent covenant between a man, a woman, and God, and that covenant is sealed and anointed by God Almighty. Turn to Genesis 2. We'll see where this sacrament comes from. Two scriptures, Genesis 2 and 24, says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So, this is talking about a man and a woman get joined together and become one flesh. Matthew 19, Matthew is quoting here from Genesis when he talks about marriage, and he confirms this concept. Matthew 19, let's start in verse 4, we'll go through verse 6. The Pharisees have asked Jesus, is it lawful for someone to divorce his wife? In Jesus in 19.4 says, Have you not read <laughs> that he created them from the beginning? He made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now listen to this. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together let no man separate. Wow. Jesus confirms that a man and a woman become one flesh in holy matrimony. That's what we call it now. And it's God that does the joining. It's not the officiating preacher or the state or the captain of a ship. <laughs> if you get married on a ship, you know. It's God who joins them together. He joins together a man and a woman. And he does so in a holy, miraculous touch by God himself. As far as I'm concerned, you can't really get married without God being involved, okay? Anything that doesn't involve God isn't marriage. It's just a civil contract. This is another one of those sacraments that some newer denominations don't consider to be a sacrament. They do all the things that the sacramental churches do, but they just don't call it a sacrament. Since there is a human part and a God part to holy matrimony, I don't see how you can call it anything but a sacrament. Let me tell you a story about cantaloupe.com. No, it's not the melon. It's can elope, like runaway to get married.com. <clears throat> okay? A, a, a Christian preacher friend of mine uh, came to me with this money making idea. He said that he has set up a website, and the website is there to connect preachers and people that want to get married. And he said there's a great need for people that aren't going to church. Uh, they don't have a relationship with a pastor, but they want a Christian wedding, and so they want to be married by a Christian preacher. And so the idea is preachers can sign up on this website. They can say, this is the geography I'll cover. This is the fee that I'll charge for a wedding. And, uh, and then uh, couples that want to get married, they go to the website. They find a preacher in their area to marry them. The, the couple pays the fee on the website, and then that gets split between the website and the preacher. And my friend described it like this. He said, it's a way to make extra money with very little work, and you make a couple happy. Well, I tried to explain to him why I could just never be a part of this website, and he never got it. <laughs> I explained that I couldn't, in good conscience, join together two people that I didn't know. You know, I had to know them. I had to spend time with them to build a relationship with them. I had to feel the confirmation of the Holy Spirit in my spirit, knowing that God says, I want to join them together. He said, well, they're going to get married anyway. Why not let it be you that collects the fee and does the ceremony? <laughs> he, just <laughs> he just couldn't grasp the concept of my sacramental worldview, right? Marriage wasn't a ceremony that just anybody could be a part of. The ceremony was just there so that everybody would know what God's doing. You know, God doesn't need the ceremony. We humans do to point to the holiness, to point to the miracle of jo God joining two different people together into a lifelong bond that we call marriage. 
my friend just couldn't understand that the preacher doesn't join the two people together in marriage. God is the one that joins them, right? And I couldn't be a part of a marriage ceremony where God was not the one doing the joining. <laughs> well, anyway, marriage, marriage to me is a holy relationship. It's, uh, um, it, there is a holy bed in marriage. I'm going to try to keep this PG. Turn to Hebrews uh, 13. Hebrews 13 verse 4. First part of Hebrews 13 4 says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. So the idea that a marriage bed could be defiled means by definition that that marriage bed is holy. You can only defile holy things, right? If it's not holy, it can't be defiled. Well, so how would we defile the marriage bed? Uh, I'm going to say there's two things we can do to defile the marriage bed. One is uh, by bringing someone other than your spouse into that bed. And you know what? It doesn't have to be physically that bed. It, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's um, a matter of fact, you can be having an affair in your mind and you have defiled your marriage bed. You're defiling that holy relationship that God made with you and your spouse. The second way we can defile our marriage bed is by not honoring our spouse in the intimacy of that bed. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7 and verses 3 through 5. 3 reads, The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And then listen to this. And the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may dis devote yourself to prayer or whatever, and then come together again, so that the accuser will not tempt you because of your lack of control. Fulfill your duties to each other, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. I'm going to try to keep this PG, like I said. Um, God has designed us so that the intimate duties of marriage for both spouses are supposed to be wonderfully good, not onerous. Okay? We are the only mammals who can control our sexual urges. We're the only mammals who find pleasure in each other. We're the only mammals who don't have to be procreating in order to enjoy each other's intimacy. God designed us this way on purpose. And I'll tell you what I think that purpose is. One day, we're going to live for eternity with God, right? And we're destined to be the bride of Jesus. That means we're destined to have a marriage-like relationship with Jesus in eternity. We'll live in intimate fellowship with Him forever. This is why God designed us to enjoy the intimacy of marriage here on this earth because I think He wants us to have a foretaste, uh, an idea of what it's going to be like to be with Him. And let me tell you a little story about that and then we'll wrap up. Debbie was uh, driving along. It's been several years ago. Uh, I, th I think she was driving to the office to be with me for a little while. And... Um, as she was driving along, she was just praying and talking to the Lord. And she said, you know, Lord, I'd like to really feel your love for me. And she said it was sort of like, you know, an explosion in the car. She just felt this all of a sudden, just felt this um, very powerful emotion of love and compassion. As the Lord just came over her and she couldn't breathe. Uh, she was afraid she'd wreck the car after a couple, few seconds. She said, Lord, stop, stop. <laughs> she was afraid she'd wreck the car. She said, and, and then the Lord lessened that, but it gave her a taste of that intimate relationship with the Lord. She said it was way more intimate than anything that she had known even with me. That's the way it's going to be when we're with Jesus in eternity. Now, I want to continue 
our teaching on the sacrament of holy matrimony and talk about how can the marriage bond be broken and a couple of other things. And we'll pick that up next week. And, uh, and then we'll also cover the sacrament of confirmation or as the Eastern Orthodox like to call it, the sacrament of chrisms.